episode of The Mixtape with Scott. I'm the host, Scott Cunningham, professor of economics at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. I have the honor this week of having on the show Dr. Avanish Dixit, professor emeritus at Princeton University. Uh, Dr. Dixit needs no introduction. Uh, he is an extraordinarily impactful economist who's made seminal contributions to areas like development, micro theory, game theory, industrial organization, trade, probably some other stuff I'm not even thinking of. Um, I will just say it made me so happy and I felt so fortunate to have a chance to interview him as I've been a very long time admirer um, of him and been astonished by the range of material that he's produced from very technical uh, theory to very generally accessible uh, popular books about economics. In our conversation, Dr. Dixit shares his journey from growing up in India as the son of a university professor of physics, his own uh, academic trajectory towards becoming a mathematician, and then how that ambition trans in, transitioned into becoming an economist. Uh, the story of it is a story of randomness and chance, and there were many of those that he ends up telling as he tells them, I just kept thinking, how take one person out of our life or put one person in our life and who knows where we would be. Um, so he talks a lot about that, talks a lot about his uh, tutelage under the late uh, Bob Solo, uh, his time as a student at MIT, as well as background um, on the origin of that paper, uh, that 1977 American Economic Review article on monopolistic competition with Joe Stiglitz. Um, so I hope that all of you enjoy this as much as I did. The podcast is devoted to the real stories of living economists, it tries to create out of those personal narratives, something like an oral history of the profession. And this episode is just a tiny sliver of Dr. Dixit's remarkable story, but I hope that it comes across that he is a very generous man and a very pleasant person to speak with, not even touching upon how brilliant he is. So thank you so much for tuning in and uh, share the podcast if you like it. All right. Well, it is my pleasure to have with me on the podcast someone who uh, I've been a long time admirer of, but this is my first time to get to ever talk to them. Uh, Dr. Avanesh Dick Dixit. Dr. Dixit, thank you for so much for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, before, for the sake of the listener, um, if you could just start off, if you could tell us your your full name, and I already said it, but if you could just say, say it again, your name, your job title, and who pays your paycheck. Huh. Um, well, well, my first name is Avinash, last name Dixit, and... Um, uh, I am an emeritus professor that's a retired professor at Princeton. Nobody pays me a paycheck. <laughs> uh, I get money from my uh, pension account, TIA, and uh, from Social Security, <laughs> however long that lasts. <laughs> I actually didn't realize that. How long have you been emeritus? Oh, a long time. Uh, oh, okay. 10, 12 years. And I recommend to everybody, retire as <laughs> soon as you are financially able to, because then you can do all the things you want to do and yeah. don't have to do any of the things you don't want to do, so <laughs> specifically committee meetings. That sounds a wonder. That sounds, that sounds the, oh. like the best life. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get started with an icebreaker. I like to do these for the, for the before we get started. Can you tell me about a vacation that you've had um, in your life that it might not be your your favorite vacation? It doesn't have to be your worst vacation either, but it's a vacation that you sort of have noticed that you've thought about it every now and then, uh, you know, the last few years. Every now and then it just sort of has popped in your mind. Oh, hard to choose. Again, since I retired, I've been able to go uh, well with my partner on a number of cruises. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
We've been on ocean cruises. We've been on river cruises. Oh. One first we did, uh, which was a Viking cruise uh, up the Rhine and then down the Danube. And mm -hmm. uh, that was fantastic. Uh, my partner especially, she is an artist, uh, kind of painter and various other forms of art. Uh, an amateur but quite skilled mm. and for her going to places like Vienna and um, also she Jewish so going to Budapest was great for her and therefore great for me also it uh, started in Amsterdam and went all the way to Budapest so that probably is one of the more memorable that we still remember and talk about. Oh, wow. I've never been there. I've never been to Budapest. Was that your first time to go there when you went with your partner? Oh, yes. no, I'd, yeah, I've been um, uh, for a very brief conference many years ago, but that's not the same. Yeah, that's not the same. I totally get it. I totally get it. Well, that's that's neat. I, I've not been on any cruises, uh, and but uh, I, I love the water. Um, well, let, let's, let me get started. So where did, going back to your growing up, where, can you, can you remind me again where you grew up? Okay. I was born in India, in Bombay, which they now call Mumbai. And that's another mm. story I might, might not be able to get to. Um, and lived there for like the first uh, 19 years of my life. Oh. My father was a professor of physics at the University oh. of Bombay. And my mother was basically a homemaker, although graduate. So I uh, was brought up in quite a sort of intellectual is too much. But anyway, intelligent uh, home, a lot of oh. reading, a lot of talking about subjects. Uh, math was my strongest point in those days, and physics was uh, kind of secondary, a minor subject in my undergraduate work, which I did in Bombay. Mm. In those days, they didn't really have honors degrees uh, in India. So it was more or less like a, a junior college that I got the degree and in those days, if you were good at math, you went to Cambridge. Oh. Following in the tracks of Ramanujan, I suppose. So mm. that's what I did. Mm. Bombay. And I've been back for family visits, academic visits, etc., but never lived them there since. So what when you were really when you were a little kid, um what kind of games did you like to play? What kind of kid were you? Um, I, I was, uh, I think, a little bit more of a nerd. But <laughs> the, the standard things in uh, India for kids in those days were cricket and field mm. hockey. And I played a little bit of both. But mm. I wasn't very good at that, actually. Mm. What did you like to do? So if you weren't playing cricket or playing those kinds of games, what kind of... What kind of stuff did you enjoy doing, like when you were, if you could have been doing anything? Oh, um, reading quite a lot, variety of books, both in mm. Indian languages and English. Mm. And um, in those days, well, my grandparents had a home in uh, Pune, which mm. is a smaller town, now really a big town, big city, uh, like 100 miles from Bombay. And we used to go there for summer vacations. And from there, one went on uh, hikes, uh, daytime hikes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Did you have any siblings? A sister. Oh, you had a sister. Were you the oldest or was she the oldest? No, she was like four years younger than me. She passed, unfortunately, a few years. Oh, I'm ago. sorry. Okay. Okay. And so when you were little, do you remember the first time that you thought to yourself, this is what I want to be when I grow up? What was the first aspiration you had? 
uh, that I have to kind of think back uh, um, being some kind of a scientist was a fairly natural mm -hmm. thing to have. Uh, my father had uh, friends who were professors of physics and chemistry and whatnot. They used to come to our house and mm -hmm. uh, would chat with me, and uh, that seemed a good life. Mm -hmm. You enjoyed. So, so in high school, uh, did they have a lot of very strong math and and uh, mathematics based classes that you could have taken that you took in high school? No, uh, th those teachers were very good. They're not kind of research level math, but uh, yeah, teaching they were very good. And also in the college, I went to the uh, two or three really good uh, math professors. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, that, that kind of uh, reinforced my natural interest. Well, so you don't go to your dad's college though, right? You go to St. Xavier's college? He was at a different university. Yeah, he was at the same. I mean, the university had a number of constituent colleges. Oh, for I example, see. Cambridge University will have uh, yeah. Trinity College and King's College and Corpus Christi College and uh, things like that. And so my father was at the central university, not so much at the college, mm. uh, physics, uh, faculty and lab and those things. And mm. Teaching, undergraduate teaching was done in these constituent colleges and St. Xavier's was uh, one of the good ones. Oh, I see. Wait, so is physics in St. Xavier's College? Is that how it's distributed out? It's oh, like no, that? They don't teach undergraduate physics in St. Xavier's, yes. But uh, when you went to a research level, uh, graduate level, basically you transferred the university's central facility. So again, in Cambridge, for example, there are these colleges and then yeah. there's the Cavendish lab. Oh, okay. Well, so well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is it, is St. Xavier, is the college got economics? Is is that, do you end up picking like a college based on you're wanting to major in economics or what exactly is your, your is happening? Sure, but, uh, uh, I mean, these colleges teach all kinds of subjects. Oh, okay. And uh, yes, sure, St. Xavier's had its economics faculty. But no, I never did economics till much later. Oh, what That's are you majoring in at St. Xavier? Math. Math. So the, immediately you're interested in math. Yeah. And oh. that, that's how uh, I actually also majored in math at Cambridge. Mm. The, the, they have these uh, subjects called uh, triposes. So I did uh -huh. the math tripos. Oh, so your entire time at St. Xavier College in Mumbai, you, you just are majoring in mathematics? There's no economics that you experienced there? No economics. Except in oh. daily life, hey, I mean, one lives Except in the daily life. experiences, uh, economics, and kind of has casual thoughts, but I'd never kind of thought about it seriously, uh, either taking classes. So I was in the science side, and one specialized fairly quickly. So in one's first year, one would do, uh, like, math, physics, chemistry, biology, and then gradually uh, focus into one's major. So that's what I did. Now, the, uh, how I got into economics is another story. We'll, I suppose, get to that when we move to Cambridge. Yeah, I guess. We're, so you, you leave Xavier, and are you thinking to yourself, I want to become a mathematician, and so I'm going to go to Cambridge? Yes. Oh, 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 oh. So, so tell me about what, what was it about Cambridge at the time? Was it well known for something particular in mathematics? Oh, well, yeah, they've always uh, been one of the top places for mathematics. They had famous people like 
Giacciardi, yeah. the uh, the famous Indian prodigy Ramanujan was taken by Hardy as his protege, and uh, it's a kind of uh, well known story. So for Indians to do math, Cambridge. It's the uh, holy of holies. You must have been pretty excited then, when you oh, yeah. when you. Sorry. You must have been really really excited when you got there. Oh yes, yeah. Was it so you're accepted into the master's program or is it the PhD program? Oh, no, no. Uh, so as I was telling you, the Indian degree is not of the honors standard. Mm. Uh, or it wasn't in those days. They have changed it, and now it is. Uh, so I had to do the Cambridge undergraduate math degree, but I could do it in two years. I could start with senior standing. I see. That's what I did. Okay, so, okay. After um, that. So, so you go there and you do your your uh, your your sort of upskilling. You're skilling up on this mathematics training and is it is it a master's degree or is it a bachelor's it's a bachelor's it's a bachelor's so um you are you still thinking the whole time hold on one second dr dixon let me just real quick i need to pause okay sorry so um so you're at cambridge and uh you're still thinking to yourself i want to become a mathematician does that is is that continuing to flourish when you're when you're there or is it does your mind start changing no, no, I was doing well but uh, there's of course as you know pure math yeah things where you uh, set up action systems proof theorems etc mm -hmm. uh, those are uh, things like algebra topology whatnot and then mm -hmm. there's applied math uh, like uh, dynamics, differential equations, uh, optimization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And mm -hmm. gradually, as I sampled both, I realized that my main interests were on the applied side. Oh, really? And uh, the main application in those days at Cambridge was physics. Mm. Including things like cosmology and uh, whatnot. Uh, uh, that's where the kind of uh, famous mathematical physicists like Stephen Hawking and whatnot came from. Oh. And uh, I said, hey, uh, look, physics has been taken. Let me look for some other field in which applied math can prove useful. Oh. And I was very lucky. Uh, the economics uh, faculty member at my college, Corpus Christi College, was Andrew Bain, who was a mon monetary and finance economist. Later on, he was involved with the Bank of England and all that. And so I went to him and said, hey, this is what I would like to explore. What should I read? And uh, he, although he was much more on the macro and monetary side, gave me Perfect advice. He said, read the Bruce theory of value and Samuelson's foundations of economic analysis. So How I read were you? Both. How and, old were you when you said that? What was your age? Oh, I was what, about 20? Oh. So I read both and uh, actually again with my interests in applied math, uh, the Samuelson one seemed much the more natural one. The bro was fascinating, but it was like pure math. It was yeah. proving the existence of equilibrium, things like that. Uh, yeah. So uh, I went back to him and said, uh, hey, uh, this Samuelson type economics is what I want to do. Mm. And, oh, okay, there are two places for you to go to grad school, MIT and Princeton. Princeton, mm. where Will Baumol and people like Richard Quant are uh, MIT, of course, as Samuelson solo. And so I 
applied to both for graduate school, was admitted by both, and um, for whatever reason, probably because of uh, Samuelson's book, ended up at MIT. Yeah. What year is that? That's like 1964? 65. 65? Your incoming class at 65? At MIT, yes. And you hadn't taken any economics. You had just read DeBruy's book and Samuelson's book. Oh, and then I went back and read Samuelson's textbook. Oh. who kind of get some basic groundings independently of math. But yeah, yeah, it took me a while to get into the natural way economists think. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, when I was in grad school, the brilliant people who would kind of think economics so fluently, yeah. and I had to learn that slowly. Well, what did you, okay, that's really interesting. So, because you're old enough and you're motivated enough that you can sort of tell economists are thinking differently than you thought. So what did it, what did that mean? What, what did you notice back then when you were really young at the beginning? What was that way that economists thought? How is it different from the way that you were thinking? Um, Various things, but um, I mean, just quickly formulating problems in terms of supply and demand, uh, equilibrium, interaction, uh, mm. choice and decisions that underlie the interaction, all mm. those kind of things came much more naturally to them. Yeah. But to uh, kind of consciously think through. Oh, oh, that's but interesting. There wasn't a great deal of game theoretic thinking. That yeah, kind that's of what I was going to say. But, uh, there there um, was not a lot of game theory at MIT when you got there? Um, it kind of uh, existed a little bit. People might talk of uh, 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 our uh, Linear economic models class would have uh, zero sum games and the minimax theorem. And mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in imperfect competition, they might just mention Nash equilibrium. Oh. But not much. Not much was actually done with that. Is that just now? See, I, I don't know the, the, I don't know exactly how the influence happened and when it when it became so influential but was was it just a very early time like there was no departments where there would have been that kind of strong game theory it was it was just very uh, early or yeah probably not i mean i don't have a kind of wide enough perspective but there are kind of uh, isolated people in various places that did mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. but not very much. I mean, even in Princeton, game theory was pretty much in the math department. Right, right. Uh, by then, uh, all the kind of um, major figures had left to go elsewhere. Aumann, yeah. Nash himself, uh, um, Morgenstern was kind of just retiring at that point, and he was never kind of a really huge influence on other people in economics, in the economics department. Right, right. Well, so at MIT, so you get there, um, and uh, so what was that first year like? What were your, who taught your micro and your macro classes? Oh, there are various people, uh, some of whom you may or may not even uh, remember now. The first semester macro was taught by F.C. Domar, who was a Soviet specialist. Oh. And the first semester micro was taught by Bob Bishop. Oh. Was... Uh, Somewhat older, more, more Marshallian type, but uh, learned a whole lot from mm. macro. I was puzzled. 
uh, mm. because Micro had taught us um, Walras law. The aggregate value of excess demand is zero. And I mm. simply could not understand how there was just pure excess supply in the labor market when all mm. other markets were clearing. Mm. What happened mm. to Walras law? And mm. uh, now, now you might uh, remember, just around that time, although we were not on to it, Clower was writing, making the distinction between notional demand and effective demand. Yeah, yeah. And well, Ross, law applied to notional demand. There's mm. notional excess demand in the goods market corresponding to the notional excess supply in the labor market, people were planning to spend or thinking they would spend the money they were hoping to earn. But that didn't actually do any good because uh, their demand was not effective. Mm, wait, are these ideas happening when you're a grad student? Oh, no, no, we never knew of that. And that's why more or less I kind of gave up on macro. Oh. I did do the longer run macro. The second semester, Bob Solo taught mm -hmm. the growth part of macro. And that was fascinating. That fitted my skills exactly. Oh, that yeah? So, what was it, your skill? You said that. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You said that that fit your skills. What was it? What do you mean by that? Oh, the applied math skills that I'd learned at Cambridge okay. were just right for growth dynamics, uh, differential equations, their short-term and long-term solutions, things of that kind. And so okay. uh, the, the, that was uh, very much uh, the right place for me to be, with, of course, the micro-grounding of optimization decisions, both at an instant and intertemporal. Oh, do you are you gravitating towards Dr. Solo as as like maybe someone that you want to work more closely with, or is that what was it? What was even the atmosphere like? Is that how it worked? No, yeah. uh, um, matter of luck. So wow. uh, the the kind of unit I was attached to when I first came to MIT was the operations research group. Yeah. That's very much applied math. And right. uh, I, I told them, hey, I uh, also uh, want to get seriously involved in economics. Bob Solo was the economics faculty member who was associated with operations research. Uh -huh. And so they sent me to see him. And also Frank Fisher. And uh -huh. so I kind of got naturally tied into that side of uh, dynamic micro uh, growth. And of course, coming from India and with uh, two or three fellow students, I was interested in doing kind of specific growth issues that arise in less developed countries. Oh. And so when I started to do research, I got into uh, building dynamic models of growth for developing countries. And oh, that was in grad school? That That's happening in graduate that, school? And yeah, that's uh, what my PhD thesis. Oh, okay. Who, who's your advisor at MIT? Oh, well, Bob Solo, obviously. Oh, Dr. Solo was your advisor. Yeah, and Carl Schell, who uh, at that time was uh, doing optimal growth models, oh. optimization, and Peter Diamond, who oh, also wow. growth and whatnot. Hey, I mean, <laughs> what a stellar commitment. That's, that's like an all-star. So, so that's it. What did you learn from Dr. Solo that you didn't, you know, that, what, what, that you didn't, wouldn't have learned otherwise, you think? Oh, actually, the most important thing I learned was not necessarily the kind of uh, techniques of economics, 
but teaching and research supervision. Oh. He had uh, just a kind of brilliant knack of uh, kind of uh, making things interesting. Mm. So the, the, the way I put it is uh, he could even make the simplex method of linear programming seem interesting. Mm. And for supervision, I mean, at that time, he supervised like about half of the uh, mm. uh, uh, graduate students. Mm. And th there's a long line of students waiting to see him outside his door. What made him so good at that? What was his yeah. skill? Oh, uh, I don't know. But really, uh, the whole personality, the whole lot of knowledge that he had, uh, the uh, wide uh, range of knowledge that he had, mm. and he was interested in everything. So mm. when your turn came to see him, he was so relaxed. It wasn't as if uh, he was seeing you after... Uh, eight others in that last two hours. Right. Uh, he had all the time for your problems, mm. made suggestions, and when you turned in a draft, he would read it uh, very thoroughly in two or three days and come back with uh, handwritten comments in the margin. His handwriting mm. was not of the best, but once you learn to decipher it, uh, his comments were really sharp and oh, to the wow. that helped you. And so, okay, you're do you write three essays or is it one of the big the big yes. books? Yes. He wrote the, the, they were doing the three essays when you were that, 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 that was already been done. Okay, and I didn't know when that started. Sorry, oh, uh, it became the MIT uh, tradition probably oh. uh, five or six years before I started. Oh, I see. Okay. Does it start at MIT, the three essay model? Pretty much, although it was kind of coming in. Uh, I mean, the basic philosophy was uh, your career, the way economics is going, is going to be publishing scientific papers. Yeah. So your thesis, uh, which is training for that career, should be a set of scientific papers. Right, right. So you wrote three papers. And they were development growth. Is that what, and they were theoretical okay. development growth? Exactly. Theoretical models of uh, uh, what were then called dual economies, basically mm -hmm. with various aspects of transfer of labor from agriculture to manufacturing. Oh, oh. And the interaction between them. So one of the chapters was basically on the labor transfer. The second one was how uh, outputs, food from agriculture and various manufactured goods from the manufacturing sector would interact and how that would affect the labor transfer. Mm, mm, mm. And the third one was on uh, how uncertainty of um, agricultural output would play into it this is there any signs of this emerging kind of io that you end up doing later with dr stiglitz can you see signs of that at all in that dissertation uh not in that dissertation no it was uh, uh aggregate growth model with uh, just two sectors and there wasn't uh, honestly, a great deal of micro uh, imperfect competition in it. Mm. Uh, there's micro, obviously, because uh, uh, the farmers in their migration decisions ah. uh, had to think of uh, micro in the model and so on. But no, there's no IO. Okay, okay. So, but you, does MIT, I'm trying, I keep trying to like wrap my head a little bit around all, all the things that you are. Does, does MIT leave you with all these theoretical skills where you could then go and, and make this kind of work on monopolistic competition? Is it, is there something 
I, I guess I'm trying to figure out exactly what the world was like at the time and uh, just don't know enough of the context. Well, no, basically one could do anything, but uh, yeah, well, what I got was a, a mathematical toolkit from Cambridge. Yeah. So training in kind of the way economists think about economic modeling, et cetera, and how those tools bore on that modeling process from MIT. And then, of course, one could go and uh, apply them to anything. Right, and right. And a lot of that was kind of completely coincidental, opportunistic. Uh, uh, the paper with uh, Joe Stiglitz, which you mentioned, uh, I, at that point, had uh, moved on to a faculty position at Oxford. Mm. And uh, Joe was visiting and... Uh, he was doing a specific example, a, a, a specific case of product differentiation. Uh, I've now a little bit forgotten exactly what it was, but it was something to do with financial assets. He was visiting Oxford? He came and presented or something? Uh, yeah, he was a, a year visitor, and then he came as a full professor at Oxford a bit later actually, just as I was about leaving. Oh, okay. And But the, the, the year that he was there, uh, so I, I read that paper and said to him, hey, there's something much, much more general there. Uh, where we can think of product differentiation more generally, not just among financial assets, which might be kind of... Uh, imperfectly correlated because of, uh, well, imperfect correlation of financial assets, but imperfect competition more generally and imperfect. Uh, he wasn't thinking of the, he wasn't thinking of the imperfect competition in that original paper. He was thinking of something to do with assets. No, but, but uh, the people who marketed those assets were oh. in imperfect competition with each other. Right. And he had a kind of a specific model. Oh, of, that's the, he had the special pick. Got it. Okay. So kind of much, much more generally uh, valid. And yeah. how do you do that? How do you um, have in general terms uh, huh. imperfectly uh, uh, correlated assets? The CES function seemed a very natural one to try. So huh. that, that's, a, that's how it went. Uh, How quickly did that paper come together? Oh, uh, the first draft, probably uh, uh, a term in Oxford, that's like eight weeks. Uh, eight weeks? Fairly, yeah, fairly quick. And then, of course, uh, it got um, revised and extended and uh, all kinds of things. Well, oh, so okay. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, you were asking what kind of influence Bob Solo had on me. Yeah. And although I don't know this for sure, from what I hear, he was very instrumental in um, bringing that paper to wide attention. He was teaching really? class, well, at MIT. He was teaching a class on uh, general kind of research topics. And mm. he saw that paper and thought, hey, well, we should kind of, in the class, read this paper and study it. And uh, again, I, I don't know for sure, but my belief is that a number of users of that model, Paul Krugman, Paul Romer, Olivier Blanchard, uh, got the idea of using that CES imperfect competition model from mm. that class, from Solo's class. Wow. Had you sent it to him? You had, you had mailed it to him or something? Or he saw it in the AR? Oh, uh, no. I mean, of course, uh, uh, I mailed uh, everything I did to him. Hey, oh. the, the, the way you would send things to your teacher. Right. He, he continued to be a very important person for you, what, long after you graduated? Oh, yes. No. 
Wow. Well, so I'm curious about how you and Dr. Stiglitz kind of worked what the jigsaw puzzle piece was. What, what was the comparative advantage that both of you had on that partnership? Well, we had kind of similar math skills. Joe was two years ahead of me at MIT and had taken similar classes. So mm. oh, we would just stand at the blackboard either in my office in Oxford or his office in Oxford and work things out. Uh, so hard to pin down who contributed what. It yeah. was back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Is there a point where I guess you kind of shared it? It sounds like it might have been coming through Dr. Solo, but, but, and in your life, though, looking back, when did you start to get the feeling that it really was becoming a very influential paper? Do you remember things? Oh, uh, it was published in like 77. And I think uh, by the time, two or three years after that, when one started to see... Uh, uh, Paul Krugman using it in international trade, uh, Paul Romer using it in uh, growth theory, etc. Uh, the, the citation count started to go up. Yeah, one kind of started to feel that. Uh, mm. Yeah, the, the, this was turning out to be something uh, pretty big. Were you surprised to see it? Uh... That you know, because of your background in in development and growth, were you were you sort of impressed or intrigued when it began to be used so much in international trade? Was that something you sort of saw saw easily that that would happen, or were you sort of oh, sort of intrigued? Uh, no, at that time, remember in the uh, mid sixties. Uh, especially India, for example, uh, there wasn't a huge amount of international trade. There are kind of pretty closed economies. Uh, the uh, liberalization of international trade to the extent that we've seen until recently came rather later. But mm. no, the, another part of the story, how I got into the uh, the international trade aspect was another very opportunistic thing. So in 1974, uh, when I'd been at Oxford for about four years as a relatively junior faculty member, I got an offer of a full professorship at the University of Warwick, mm. uh, what Americans call Warwick. Okay. Um, it's near Stratford-on-Avon and a very good economics department. And I took that up. Uh, and one, one of the things that happened there was that they had a very good uh, I.O. group. Mm. And in that context, uh, they invited a Norwegian by the name of Victor Norman from Bergen to spend a year. And uh, he and I got talking about various things. We wrote a paper, et cetera. But somehow or the other, we got talking about international trade. Mm. And th th this was, again, a totally opportunistic uh, development where th there's this uh, trade issue. And he or I could uh, say, hey, the, uh, having heard somebody present something in a seminar or something like that, hey, we can do it uh, much more efficiently, much more economically using this mathematical technique. And so let's look for some other problems. Mm -hmm. And we uh, went and did, collected together so many of these problems that we said, let's just write a book. And mm -hmm. he actually developed exactly the Paul Krugman model. Really? Yeah, actually, probably even before Paul did. But uh, in Norway, 
they have much more relaxed attitude. There isn't the same kind of pressure to publish. Mm. So I published it. Oh, wow. Is there a draft of that floating around? Yes. Uh, I think I still have a, a scan or Xerox of a handwritten draft. Ah. Wow. Wait, was that his or was that co-author? Oh, no, that, that was his alone. Oh, that was his. Yeah. Oh, so we did put it in the book that mm. morning. But by, by that time, Krugman's model was also known. So we gave a kind of overall uh, uh, comprehensive treatment for that time. But mm. uh, the, the, that book uh, on international trade is another of my kind of uh, well-cited, well-used books. You know, it's interesting. Uh, not a lot of economists simultaneously have this very active writing articles and writing books. And you have written textbooks and books that are very general interest. And I'm just curious, you know, I'm I'm right that you're unique for doing that, right? That's not that wasn't common amongst your peers, was it? Um, well, when I started out, it certainly wasn't. But since then, people have written books of one form or another, either um, collection of articles with some supplementary things or just standalone books. So uh, my Princeton colleague, Jean Grossman, has worked with Elhanan Helpman on uh, research papers published in journals, both on international trade and on political economy, and they've written books on that. Paul Krugman yeah. himself uh, collected his papers into books. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Lucas did. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's kind of uh, becoming somewhat more common to have uh, both Papers and books. you were doing it very early. It seems like you've always been writing books, or you've written a lot of books and a lot of articles of a variety, textbooks, but even things like games of strategy. That's clearly got this huge, much bigger audience than just economists. Is, was it always something that you were you envisioned early on that you wanted to write books and articles? Hey, uh, you know how in life things happen more by accident than by design. Yeah. Okay, so um, after Warwick, I came to Princeton in 1980, and I had a joint appointment between the economics department and the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs. Mm. So what was I going to teach in public affairs? By the way, going back a little bit, when I was at Warwick, uh, in connection with the, um, my uh, modeling in industrial organization, one of the things I got into thinking about was uh, strategic entry deterrence. Mm. Pence was working on that at the time, and he had a paper which I thought wasn't really quite satisfactory. Can I do this better? And the way, uh, again, things happen by accident. Somebody, now I forget who, said, you should read Tom Schelling's book on game theory. And that was a revelation. Really? Yeah. Just amazing. I mean, uh, uh, that's where, I mean, you can do math. You can do Nash equilibrium. You can uh, do minimax. Mm. But each shelling and game theory comes to life. Mm. So, okay. So I had uh, had that uh, revelation. And well, when I got to Princeton, what would be a nice thing to teach to people in the Woodrow Wilson School? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I can develop a class on shelling type game theory, mm -hmm. uh, which um, basically conveys strategic ideas 
it's a tiny bit of math, but uh, it's basically about ideas. Yeah. And uh, that class was quite successful. Oh, well, by the way, uh, so one of the things that gets done in those classes, I taught that for a number of years, was completely screening in class the movie Dr. Strangelove, which oh, really? is full of uh, strategic issues that are going on about credibility, threats, et cetera, et cetera, and then discussing it from a game theoretic point of view. Oh. So th th that was a real fun class. And again, success of a class depends to a very significant extent on students. Mm. Again, I got lucky. Uh, the mm. very first class had Danny Roderick and Anne Case. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the, their inputs, the whole discussions. Uh, so uh, I kept on teaching that class for uh, a number of years, both to Woodrow Wilson School master's students and then to Princeton undergraduates. Mm. One year I was going to be on leave. And Barry Nelboff uh, was at that time a junior faculty member who also had these kind of very wide interests. Uh, so uh, he offered to teach that class when I was on leave. He did that. And then we said, hey, maybe we've, ever, well, we've got a book there. Mm -hmm. So that's where the uh, thinking strategically, the popular book, came from. That's where it came from? You had already developed the class and you had been teaching it and then he comes and then, in. And then uh, Barry, of course, I mean, he's uh, as smart as they come and uh, he changed a lot of things, etc. So it was really a genuine um, joint authorship. It wasn't as if uh, I had the, all the material and he was a TA or anything like that, not at all. So, wow. the, it was uh, both a pleasure to do with him and uh, uh, the, the then, um, I don't know if in your other interviews, uh, people have admitted so much, how much happens by chance. Hmm. So we had this book, didn't have a great title for it, Games, theory and art of strategy, uh, we thought of that. Uh, publishers said, put the word theory in the title of a book and sales go down by 50%. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, somehow or the other, the Norton was looking at this, the publishers, W.W. Norton. Uh -huh. And Hal Varian was one of their authors, the micro book and all that kind of clued in. Yeah. Uh, so he saw that and said to Barry and me, we uh, knew him personally, of course, for quite a bit, said, I have just the title for you, Thinking Strategically. Mm. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's yeah, so the, you, you see how much happens by chance. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you should always be thankful for your luck. Like yeah. Napoleon was asked, uh, what's the quality you value most in your generals? And he said, luck. <laughs> but you've taken advantage of all that luck that's come, that, that you know have been able to capitalize on it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have got to recognize it and seize it. Yeah, yeah. The we're we're sort of at the getting close. To, I didn't want to keep you longer, but I I was curious, you know, um, about your collaborations over the years. It seems like one of the things I've heard is is that one of the ways to kind of connect your early years to sort of longevity is just find when you find people that you work really well with just to, to continue to work with them a little bit. I was curious though, what do you, what is your thought when you hear that and what's kind of been in your mind sort of help, helped you sort of have this long career? <laughs> 
so hard to say but it may be uh, exactly the quality that's very often a bad one which is switching from one field to another oh yeah so our kind of adhd style of research so right. better way to put that uh, which i do is uh, my research is serial monogamy <laughs> uh, i marry a field for a few years uh, the, the, then something else attracts my interest and i move on to oh. that field so i've move what from uh, development and growth to imperfect mm -hmm. competition io to international trade mm -hmm. then got into some political economy got into uh, investment under uncertainty and real options mm -hmm. and so on and so on i think uh, that keeps the mind alive mm. and mind alive is an important part of sustaining a career i think right? right right did you ever have anybody that made a comment that said you're jumping around too much um yes yeah uh, and sometimes people who are kind of dedicated to one field mm. uh, well when i move out of that say isn't our field good enough for you <laughs> and that, that's not at all the case i mean there are great issues there but then uh, i saw this other issue and had to chase after it oh uh, yeah yeah so why did you stay at princeton all, this whole time i bet you had so many opportunities to leave what what's made princeton just feel like home this whole time Oh, uh, excellent colleagues, uh, collaborators, uh, yeah. collaborators like uh, Jean Grossman, of course, and then John Londrigan in the politics department. Mm. And then when I was um, starting to think about uh, real options, uh, mm. Sandy Grossman, who was at Princeton at the time, was immensely helpful. Mm. Richard Quant has been a long, long, long-standing friend, supporter, colleague. Mm. Um, and then a variety of family things also. Uh, that, um, um, my sister and her husband lived uh, in the nearby area. Then my mother, after she was widowed uh, came to live with us mm. and uh, things like that so the the, the uh, high costs of moving but yeah uh, uh, on the whole it's worked very well now there have been serious differences with colleagues in the princeton department but uh, they yeah be but you know it seems like that um you, you called it that adhd but that kind of uh that curiosity that drives you from field to field, it, it would probably really be good to be in a, a great department with so much diversity and so many new faces all the time. I bet that's just really been a source of constant inspiration. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, even when I kind of want to do something different, uh, uh, there's somebody interested in discussing it with me and in yeah. some collaborating with me. Well, so are you still working on some things these days? I know you've like you said you've retired, but your mind you also said your mind being active, you keep want you keep being curious. So you do you have things that still excite you now and you're working on? Yes, actually, um again in a very ADHD style. Well, one of the things I was working on for a few years, actually, so that was more a serial monogamy thing, was corruption. Oh. And again, kind of going back to um, my interest in developing countries where there's uh, the, that's a serious problem. Yeah. The 
idea I had was whether it could be solved by private action. And uh, what that meant was that, say, the group of business people who are competing with each other for contracts and so on, and each of them has the incentive to bribe the official to get the contract. But collectively, they are losing. Mm. So it's like a prisoner's dilemma between them. Can they mm. solve the prisoner's dilemma the way many other prisoner's dilemmas are solved by private collective action in a repeated yeah. game? And uh, the idea was that uh, they would establish an independent rating agency which would rate companies by how clean they were in uh, matters of uh, bribery or uh, other kind of uh, bad forms of behavior. It would be like a Michelin rating for restaurants. So this is a three-star business. This is only a two-star business. And this business gets no stars at all. And we floated that idea around a little bit in India. And you know why it fell flat? Why? People pointed out that it's such a litigious place that if you give a business no stars, they'll sue you. And you can get sued as a customer if you gave somebody zero stars? Uh, if you gave a company zero company? stars and said, this company is uh, corrupt, basically. The uh -oh. company would sue you. Uh, for uh, damaging their business and uh, try and get uh, millions and millions of rupees from you and tie you up in courts for years. There's something different. There's something different there than there is in um, in other countries. What, what's the what's the why why can they do that there, but that doesn't happen in other? What is there some particular oh, law? Uh, uh, I don't know, but maybe it's a little bit like America itself is a very litigious society. Uh, there are lots of lawyers, uh, lots of courts, and courts move very, very slowly. So yeah. anyway, that corruption thing came to nothing. And yeah. I do a number of things. I've done small mathematical models of uh, transmission of COVID um, and what are the kinds of measures that would uh, reduce it um, and purely fun things like a pure optimization problem. How early should you plan to go to an airport? And the point is that uh, usually you can never hit it exactly. There, there is uncertainty and the standard methods of optimization under uncertainty, there are loss functions. You make an error one side, you suffer some loss, you make an error the other side, you suffer some loss. Those loss functions are usually taken to be quadratic. That's easy because then you get linear action rules. But the loss function for getting to an airport is very, very asymmetric and not quadratic. You go there five minutes early, you wasted five minutes. You go there five minutes too late, maybe you wasted a day. So the right, right. optimization is trickier. And so I did that for fun. And it turns out that how early you should plan to go it differs greatly depending on whether it's a shuttle flight that goes every hour or a transatlantic flight that goes um, twice a day, or a trans-Pacific flight that goes only once a day. And there are formulas for that. A uh, lot of academics would find that useful. Yeah. Well, it has been so nice talking to you, Dr. Dixit. Um, I really appreciate you giving me your time and sharing uh, about your your story. Um, no, it's been fun. Uh, you pointed me to some others that you had done before, and uh, they also look very interesting. And I thought, hey, this is something I should do. I am so glad you did. 
Well, um, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and uh, say say goodbye. It's uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you likewise. Enjoy your time in Spain. And thank you for having me.